Welcome to Cashflow Diary, a podcast where we discuss business, money, real estate, and the sharing economy. As a full-time real estate investor, entrepreneur, and all-around problem solver, I have had the privilege of developing individuals into powerful business owners. And today, the focus turns towards you. Our mission is to help you build your real estate empire by leveraging strategies to grow yourself, your mind, and your wallet. Let's get started. Mike, you got a four bedroom, one and a half bath. Mike, uh, feel free to tell me what you want to do with this. So that way, uh, when I get to that part, I'm ready. Uh, 20 to 23,000 repairs. Okay. Uh, Taxes. You like the taxes of 2,500 a year? Okay. And also the one and a half bath. The going rent for this home is 12 to 1250. Tenant pays for all utilities. Okay. I have many properties in this area and feel that I can purchase this property for 30 to 32.5. Total maximum investment is 55.5. So I need to know, are you trying to hold this house? I assume you, the words that you're saying tell me that you're going to hold this house. So let me give you a quick, um, let me re- give you a quick way to, it's a quick analysis that I use for if I'm going to hold a property. And here it is. I'm going to take, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 1.5% of my total all-in cost. So in this case, you're saying 55,500 is going to be your total all-in. So remember, total investment. I'm going to multiply that by 1.5%. Now you can change that number to suit your needs. But for me, I wouldn't go lower if you're trying to cash flow. I definitely wouldn't go lower than 1.5% regardless of the marketplace that you're in. This number is, this 1.5% is regardless of the marketplace. So I'm going to take that 1.5%. All I'm going to do is 55,500 times 1.5% is equal 832.50. And so long as on a monthly basis, the property can generate 832.50, it's a go, no go. Now, how much above and below that? How much above that? Uh, determines how strong of a go, no go it is for me. So what does that mean? In this particular case, you're saying it's, oh, 1200 to 1250 a month. So clearly this is a strong go. Now, when you say total max investment, I'm assuming that's not what it's, that that's not what it would be worth. So that's good. I would like to know, Mike, yeah, thanks for responding. I'd like to know if, uh, what you think the total after repair value is. Uh, but putting 55000 into this so far seems to make sense. I, uh, I guess, what, what is it that, are you asking me how, are you asking me to uh, raise the capital? What, I'm trying to understand what you're asking me to, to show you uh, on this particular one. So um, I, I think it's how to raise the capital, but I'm not 100% sure because you say that you already have uh, a number of houses in this particular area. So, and if it is raised the capital, are you talking about the purchase price or all fifty five thousand? Um, that that I, is that's kind of a little bit. I need a little bit more information, and we're almost there. And I can give you some direction on what to do here. But before we get to that point, um, twenty five hundred dollars. Uh, I don't know why you say you like the taxes. I don't know many people who go. I like paying my taxes, and I like taxes. One thing that I, I want to say in general from uh, being a holder of property, the first thing that we do, no no matter the property, is we always contest the property taxes, period. Uh, There are CPAs in every jurisdiction that I've I've worked in thus far that know how to contest property taxes. And there's usually someone who will do it on a contingency basis, meaning that their fee is a percentage of the savings that they actually generate for you. So um, I, I never like property taxes. <laughs> so yeah. All right. And it says you're asking, is this a good investment and how to raise the capital? Okay, cool. That's what I thought you were going to do. All right. So we're going to get into what I call the profit analysis quadrant because I raise capital. Um, anytime I'm raising capital, this is how it's done. I use this. Uh, for those of you who have participated in our uh, raising private capital mastermind group. This is something that we go over. Um, and you, you in great detail, something that we're going to, we use all the time. It's how I, it's just how I do it. So I 
unfortunately, we don't have enough time right now to just go into each section, but I'm just going to show you how to do it and know, Mike, that I th since you are in the Raising Private Capital Mastermind group right now, you're going to get uh, a, a, a very detailed video that breaks down each of these so that you have the ability to go out there and raise more capital too. This is, you've heard people call the uh, napkin presentation. This is my version of the same that has the ability to do so. So over here, we're talking about appreciation. Here is depreciation. Here is amortization. And this is the cash flow. Okay, so I'm going to calculate all of those in this particular situation so that we know what the total deal pays. And then, Mike, you, all you have to decide is how much of each quadrant you want to give away. So what, it, what I mean by that, and just so that we're clear, this is quadrant one, this is quadrant two, this is quadrant three, this is quadrant four. Okay. What I mean by that, these are four of the benefits. This isn't all of the benefits, but these are four of the major benefits as specifically financial benefits as it relates to real estate. So any one of these benefits, you as the transaction engineer or CEO of the company have the ability to give away and or keep some of those. Depending on how many benefits you give away or keep, that's what's going to attract your investment capital. All right. Uh, and and that's, that's it. It's just no more complicated than that. So in this particular case, we know that we have an after repair value of 100K. And we're saying, and for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to keep the number simple for me and say that your total investment is going to be $60,000. That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say you need $60,000. Therefore, what you need or what you have, or what you'll have at the end of the day is an equity position of $40,000, okay? That, that's what you have. Now, your goal, though, what you said is that you wanted to buy and hold the property. Up. So uh, we're going to leave that there for now. So now we have one particular benefit. Over here, depreciation, you must, to understand depreciation, you got to take into account two things, the difference between the improvements and the cost of the land. Now, if we have a total investment of, what is that, 55, we had a total investment of 55,500. Okay, so we know that he's going to do, let's call it $20,000 in repairs. And then that means 35,000 in this case, let's see, yeah, let's leave it at 35,000, is 35,500 is going to be the cost of the existing structure and the land. So in order to figure this out, we, this is what we've got to do. Okay, I won't do any seller financing on this and none whatsoever. So I saw that 35, so we've got 35.5. 35.5 is the purchase price of the existing structure and the land, okay? So in every jurisdiction, you can only depreciate the amount of improvements. The improvements are the things you do to the property, like these components, he's going to add $20,000 worth of new stuff. And the existing structure is the improvement above the land. There's a ratio that's generally accepted. And again, your CPAs in every area know what that is. I'm going to say in this particular area that it's an 80-20 ratio, meaning 80% of the $35,000 price is allocated towards the improvement 20% is the land. Here's why this is important. All I'm going to do is multiply by 80%. And that's going to give me a number of 28,400. 28,400. <clears throat> depreciation is done. Now I'm going to also use what is known as straight line simple depreciation. For a residential property of this kind, that is done over 27 and a half years. 27.5. Okay. All I'm going to do is add up these two numbers and divide by 27.5. 284 plus 20,000 divided by 27.5. Did I do that correctly? Excellent. Is 1760. <clears throat> 1760 is the amount of depreciation credit, is what we're going to call this depreciation credit that is available to be had in this deal every year using straight line depreciation. Now, the, uh, to, be, to, to fast forward really fast, 
under no circumstances would I recommend doing straight line depreciation. But at the same time, you got to understand, I'm not a CPA. I'm just a guy that uses these things all the time showing you how I would do it. But straight line depreciation at least gives you 1760 of depreciation credit. What does that mean? That means you multiply this number by the tax bracket, and that's going to determine your dollar for dollar value. So in this case, if I'm in a 30% tax bracket, state and federal, I can get $528 every year as a credit from the government, right? So that's 30%. Well, here's the other question. What if I'm in a 50% tax bracket? So we have 1760 times 50% is 880. What that simply means is if I'm in a higher tax bracket, depreciation is more valuable to me. Because you mentioned, Mike, that you have a number of other properties, I'm going to bet that your tax bracket is going to be on the lower end of most of the numbers. It's going to be on the lower end, which means someone who has high income and likely high tax bracket is going to benefit more from this quadrant than you are right now. That's possible. May not be true of your situation. Got to talk to your CPAs, attorneys, etc. But here's the point. There's 1760 available to be had and split up one way or the other. So we've got $40,000 of equity, 1760 of depreciation. The next thing is amortization. I'm going to make the assumption, uh, and this is a total assumption, that what you're going to do is you're going to fix this and then you're going to rehab the money, uh, rehab the property and, or, or sorry, refinance the property. That's what you're going to do. When you refinance the property, I'm going to assume that you're going to get a 70 30 loan, meaning 70% of the loan, is, or sorry, 70% of the value of the property is in the loan and 30% of equity still remains. That's what I'm going to assume. I could be wrong. But what does that mean? That means you said the after repair value is $100,000. So if you look at the calculator, all I'm going to do is multiply by 70%, which means the loan is $70,000. Okay. So we're going to end up with, at the end of the day, I'm fast forwarding to the end, end of the day, $70,000, $70,000 loan uh, balance. That's what we're going to start because you said you want it to buy and hold it. So what I'm going to do is a calculation to figure out how much of the principal is going to be paid down over the first year of ownership, okay? Over the first year of ownership. That's what I'm going to do. So over the first year of ownership, uh, let's go on a 30-year loan, and I'm going to be ridiculous and say you had to pay 6% interest, okay? I'm not saying you will, but it's fixed. 30-year loan, uh, 6% interest. This calculator is telling me that your payments are going to be uh, $419.69. That's what it's going to be. But what I want to know is how much principal has been paid down completely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the calculator to calculate the amount of principal from payments number one to payment number 12. And it tells me that $859.67 is the principal, 859.67 is the amount of principal paid, okay, over the first year. So the reason this is important is because if you're renting it out, the tenant is paying this, this, that $859.67, for those of you who are uh, the accounting kind, actually, this number ends up on your balance sheet and i.e. improves your net worth. So this is the building wealth, wealth principle that you're allowed to do. This is also the growth principle, meaning over time, as you can see, let me see, I'll show you here. Over time, what ends up happening As you can see by the blue line, the blue line becomes the principal uh, that is the, the amount of payment, but at the same time, you're building equity inside this building, and that happens over time. Over time, what ends up happening is that you end up with $70,000 that someone else paid for you. So that $70,000 be becomes growth. What is, that's what happens inside your portfolio. But in the first year, you only get $859. Uh, and 67 cents of the $70,000. Uh, 
Hopefully that makes sense. Then we have cash flow. The cash flow, let me see, you said it rented for 1200. I'm going to use the low number, 1200 a month. So here's how I like to do that number when I'm, when I'm uh, out there working. So I'm going to take the rent at 1200 a month and I'm going to say half of that is going to go straight to the expenses. So half of 1200 is 600, leaving 600. The 600 a month is the net operating income. It's income minus expenses equals net operating income. That's what I'm going to say. From that net operating income, I'm going to subtract the mortgage payment. The mortgage payment said 419.69. I already have that. Okay. So in this case, uh, we'll use the black. We're going to call it 420, which leaves 100 and. $180 of cash flow on a monthly basis. All I'm going to do is multiply that by 12 to get the annual number. And that gives me 2,160. So I've got 2,160. I got 800. Let me, circ let me highlight and star all the important numbers. We know what the entire deal does. Now, we've got all of this going on in various forms. We know what we've got. So here's the concept. Use what you have to get what you need so you can have what you want. I'll say that again. Use what you have to get what you need so you can have what you want. Now, that was the phrase as it was taught to me by one of my mentors. And it's very true. Use what you have. This is what you have. This is what you will have control over. You have the ability and skill set to make all this happen. What do you need? The money. So you can have what you want, the property, the cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. So at this point, what you have to decide is how much of each one of these are you willing to give away in exchange for $60,000? How much are you willing to give away? Are you willing to give away half the equity? Are you willing to give away 100% of this? Are you willing to give away 50% of this and 50% of this? It doesn't really matter. To me, it matters to the person that you're talking to. So let's, let's just say you wanted to give away, um, let's, go, let's just say that you wanted to give away uh, or create a 10% return to the person. You wanted to offer them a 10% return. Now that 10% return won't be 100% in cash, but let's just assume it's 10%. Well, 10% of six, $60,000 is $6,000. So if we took, let's say they're in a 50% tax bracket, that's $880. And let's say you gave them 100% of this. Now we're at $1,600, right? Yes, $1,600. And then the rest of it you gave in equity, meaning uh, you had to give them another, what, $4,000? About $4,400 out of this? Do you think you could figure out a way to give them a 10% return? Now, in all of these situations, none of it is cash, meaning you would keep 100% of the cash flow. So you say, well, that doesn't work. What if they want cash flow? Great. Maybe you give them $1,000 of the cash flow. You give them 100% of this, 100% of this, and only $3,000 here. Um, you say, well, if it's a retirement plan, what do I do? Great. Um, I would focus on this. I would give them mostly uh, most of the equity here because they typically need growth. Um, all of those things together. So if it's a retirement plan, all you want to do right here is with the equity, uh, you want to focus on giving them the equity and you take these benefits. In fact, if it's a retirement plan, please don't give them any of the depreciation because in most cases, retirement plans can't take advantage of it. Uh, they do bank it for later, but it's so rarely used that it's, it's almost wasted. It's a wasted benefit to give them. Um, and the reason I came up with this is because what happens is that we tend to say, uh, let's just do the deal 50-50. Well, 50-50 could be unfair. Win-win doesn't have to be equal in all of these categories. But that's what happens when we do 50-50. You end up giving half of this, half of this, half of this, half of this, and you end up doing all the work. That's literally what happens. Money is a tool, just like a hammer. It's like if I loaned you my hammer, 
and went, well, the only reason you were able to build this building is because I gave you my hammer. It's not like I got the only hammer in the world. Like, seriously? So you, you want to keep that in mind as you go through. I'm going to check here to see if you've got some questions because I did just kind of blaze through that. Uh, but again, that's why you are a part of the mastermind group so that we can break that down over and over and over. What all is in the expenses? It seems high. You're correct, Daryl. You are 100% correct. The $600 is meant to be high. You're right. Um, I did that on purpose because if it works this way, the only goal you now have to do is to learn how to manage the, that 600 better. If you lower that 600, then great. That's the whole point. That's also why I wasn't satisfied with the answer of, I like $2,500 in taxes because that stinks in my opinion. That's, but that's my opinion. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare do that. And let's see. One, two, three. Uh, typical taxes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Asking, asking, is this a good investment in how to raise capital? Will the seller finance? Ray, in this case, uh, I did this with no seller financing. So if the seller were financed, sure, that's going to change this structure a little bit. It'll change this structure a lot uh, down here, but I'm assuming no seller financing. Um, let's see. Jorge, you're not here. What is in all the expenses? I think that answer. Oh, typical taxes are 4,005. I do contest all. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, good. Okay, I'm glad. That makes me feel better, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> I, was getting I was getting a little concerned. Um, but yeah, even if it is already low, I still contest anyway. There's never a time where I don't care what the number is. Uh, I want my taxes as low as possible. Um, so let's see. Anyway, as you guys can see, mastering, yes, it, it's, it's exactly like Mike is talking about. Learning to master the profit analysis quadrant is tremendously important. Uh, it's not just about doing the numbers. It's about understanding why these, who, for whom these numbers make sense. It's not just numbers. And most people want to jump straight to the numbers when it comes to it, to, to doing a deal. And you can't uh, because these benefits uh, all affect people differently and not everybody's going to make use of the benefit. That doesn't mean they don't need it or, you know, don't give it to them. It's just, it seems like a waste to me. And this is how I found this out is that I had raised a lot of capital from retirement plans and I was paying them checks uh, on a monthly, quarterly, on a quarterly basis, because we typically pay on a quarterly basis. And then my CFO said, hey, Jay, can you call all these people? Because they're not cashing their checks. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're not cashing their checks. She's like, they're not cashing their checks. And I was a little frustrated because uh, I had worked hard to create <laughs> that cash flow, right? And they're like, yeah, we didn't cash them because we don't have anything to do with them. But we're just going to put the money back in there. It's just going to sit. And in my head, I'm going, then why did I give it to you? Interesting, because I could have used that money and, and I should have given them more appreciation, more of the equity build, more of the forced appreciation. That's what this was about. And uh, I, I, did, I learned that that was not the way to, that was not the way, um, <laughs> that was not the way to go. So you can learn to do the same thing. And that's what this, that's where this comes from. This is how this is used. This is just one of many financial tools that I use in order to get deals done. Thank you for tuning in to the Cashflow Diary podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share with a friend and leave a rating and a review. If you'd like to keep the conversation going, head over to CashflowDiary.com to sign up for our email list, as well as check out all the links and resources in the show notes. Thank you again. Until next time.